Okay, so you can stop talking amongst yourselves now. <laughs> it is now precisely six o'clock by Corey's computer, at least. So, uh, welcome and good evening. So, uh, my name is Alistair Rendell, and I have the pleasure of being the Vice President and the Executive Dean for the College of Science and Engineering at Flinders U University. So, and I will be the host for uh, this evening's event. So I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. I acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. So some uh, and initially some housekeeping, so I am informed that the emergency exit, you go out that door, out through the glass doors, turn right and down the stairs, and the meeting point is in Victoria Square, which is out, out over there somewhere or other. <laughs> but just follow me. <laughs> that leave me to get burnt in the building. <laughs> Uh, facilities can be accessed outside the doorway and to the, to the left down the corridor. Um, so, welcome and thank you for joining Flinders for this research lecture series entitled Brave. If you wish to share the event uh, with your peers, please make sure to use the hashtag Brave Research into your uh, posts and tweets and you're strongly encouraged to tweet away and post away. So, BRAVE is not just a reflection of the extraordinary research that Flinders University pursues today. It's a call to action that harks back to the earliest days of our institution. As we at Flinders make inroads in our mission to change lives and change the world, we are focused on making a difference by extending the boundaries of knowledge, by addressing the big challenges and by changing lives for the better through our research and through our engagement with our student body. Our founding Vice Chancellor, Professor Peter Carmel, explained the ambitions for Flinders in the now famous quote, we want to experiment and to experiment bravely. It is a concept that has captured the imagination of successive generations of Flinders researchers and continues to inspire us today. This bravery is evident in our researchers and, our, and the new research discoveries that we are sharing with the world for the greater good. Tonight we'll, dis we'll discuss climate change and the extinction crisis that we find ourselves facing and what we can do to help. And what, and what better researcher to enlighten us than Professor Corey Bradshaw. So Corey is a Matthew Flinders Fellow in the uh, Global Ecology uh, at Flinders University, where he heads the Flinders Modeling Node of the uh, Center of the ARC Supported Center of Excellence. Corey has over 280 peer-reviewed scientific articles, 11 book chapters, three books, including The Effective Scientist and Killing the Koala and Poisoning the Prairie. Um, he is highly cited with over 17,000 uh, citations to date. He is a member of the faculty of 1000 and fellow of the Royal Society of South Australia. He was awarded the 2017 Verco Medal from the Royal Society of South Australia, a 2017 Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio uh, Writers Fellowship, to name a few. He is regularly featured in the Australian and international media for his research. His blog, uh, conservationbites.com, has been visited by over too many, uh, 2.1 million uh, times. So with that, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Corey. So, welcome. Turn this on now. Can you hear me? Is that all right in the back? Excellent. Thanks, Alistair. I appreciate that. And uh, um, in addition to acknowledging um, the Ghana people for meeting on their land, I also want to say that we're very privileged with a, a star panel uh, afterwards. And um, I'll just, we'll introduce you probably later, but we've got Chris and Emily and Sophie and Susan who will be fielding your questions and sort of um, stimulating the conversation thereafter. 
So uh, we'll get more into that near the end. <clears throat> so I uh, appreciate the, uh, the introduction. It was very generous. I've been at Flinders now for just over two years, thoroughly enjoying myself, and was asked to do this um, a few months ago. So I'm, I've uh, probably put more work into this than I have <laughs> I'd normally. I give a lot of public lectures, and I thought I may, might, might want to take this a little bit more seriously. Um, so hopefully this will be borne out by your appreciation of what I give you. Now, when I usually give a talk, this is kind of the response of the crowd afterwards because I'm invariably known as Dr. or Professor Doom, wherever I go. Um, Chris always says that I'm far too pessimistic um, as he smiles and laughs bubbly about um, the end of the world. But <coughs> I'm going to, I am going to depress you first, and then I'm going to talk about some of the ways that I see that we can maybe dig ourselves a little bit out of this hole that we're in. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wicked problem, and therefore it requires complex solutions. So there's no silver bullets, and I think we just need to think about all the things we can do to address the problems. Now, when I'm talking about extinctions, which is the backbone, really, of this talk, what extinctions are, what status uh, the world is in right now in terms of biodiversity, and what it means for us. But when we talk about extinction, we, we tend to forget that, at least over geological time, and if you go back the three point something or odd billion years that life on this planet is thought to have existed, uh, the first metazoans, that is the, the first multi-celled animals sort of popping up at about 580 million years ago, uh, we've got one of the best examples of the earliest metazoan life here in South Australia, the Flinders Ranges. If you haven't been up there and seen the amazing fossils of the Ediacaran, highly recommend it. It's only a five-hour drive north. Wonderful place. <coughs> anyway, I digress. The, the, if you count up all the species that ever existed versus the ones that have gone extinct, almost every species has gone extinct over, over that entire 3.5 billion years, right? Which means that, of course, speciation just keeps slightly a pace of extinction, but it doesn't happen at a nice constant rate, right? So if you look at it that way, it's the average species lifetime is between 1 and 10 million years. That doesn't mean that every species lasts that long. It means some can last hundreds of millions of years. Others can come in and out of existence in a geological heartbeat. But it does mean that we have these pulses of extinctions. And of course, we've got the most infamous of those, the five great mass extinctions. There are actually a lot more than this. In fact, the Devonian, for, as an example, is in fact four different events. Okay, we've tended to lump them together, depending on the evidence and obviously the loss of evidence over time. But you can see the kind of magnitudes of loss, sort of the, the big one being the Permian, where up to 96% that's been questioned recently, but uh, certainly the biggest extinction event in the world, in the Earth's history. And then uh, the Cretaceous being the, the, the last one, which is infamous for what reason? Dinosaurs, what happened? Yeah, so big bolide impact, Yucatan Peninsula, Chick Chicxulub Crater, and uh, the dinosaurs turned into birds. Okay, so we didn't lose dinosaurs, they just turned into birds. Uh, now, unfortunately, we are in the sixth mass extinction, known as the Anthropocene, which is very roughly calculated to be about a thousand times the extinction rate that we generally measure between the mass extinction events. Now, that's highly variable because not only do we not tend to see when things go extinct, because as species get rare, they're harder and harder to detect, but also because we simply haven't censused all the species on the, on the planet. We think we know a lot, but as you get into the small things, at least, we don't know really what's out there. Um, Anthropos, of course, in Greek meaning uh, human and seen era. Now, a lot of that has been driven in the most recent period by things like deforestation. Now, this is a shot of flying over Borneo. Um, it's... Uh, if you fly any, t any part over Borneo, if you can see through the smog and the, and the, um, and the uh, bushfire smoke, this is what you'll see. Now, people see that as being the, the big driver of extinction. In fact, most of extinctions in the last few hundred years have been driven by habitat loss. And although I'm focusing on forests here, that applies equally to, say, macrophyte forests or seaweeds within the ocean. And you look, this is just an example of forest loss between uh, 2002 and 2012, work by Hansen 
sort of uh, enhanced satellite imagery, showing the cumulative damage uh, by the intensity you can see there. And if I overlay that with agricultural uh, use, croplands and grazing, you can see a pretty strong correlation. In fact, over 80% of deforestation since the 1950s is a result of agricultural expansion and intensification. Okay. Now that's just one decade. But when you look at this kind of thing, and who knows where this is? Mount Lofty Ranges, yeah, Adelaide Hills. This is my backyard. In fact, uh, I don't think my little plot of land is too far away from there. We see this, we think, oh, clean, green. Uh, but we then, we don't necessarily notice vineyards, which don't really have much living in them at all, especially when they're herbicided to death and trimmed up really nicely, or the pine plantations over there. In fact, we have less than 10% of the total native vegetation that used to be in the Mount Lofty Ranges existing today. And right here where we stand now, in the Adelaide Plains, it's less than 4%. Okay? So we have a lot of invasive species, a lot of uh, cropland species, a lot of cultivated species, but that's just as bad in many ways from a biodiversity perspective as total deforestation that you saw in the Borneo example. In fact, Australia-wide, we've lost nearly 40% of our forest cover since European colonization. And that also means that there's been a lot of degradation and um, fragmentation of the existing land. Now, in the 2000s, Queensland was considered a deforestation hotspot. But before that, of course, we had the wheat belt. You see this massive scar here. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the government paid farmers to clear their land at a massive scale. And of course, in the southeast, that happened earlier in um, European colonization time. In South Australia, we've lost somewhere in the vicinity of 75% of our forest cover in agricultural lands as a total, which represents about 25% of the state. Now, all that agriculture has meant massive changes to the animal life. And if you can think of this graph as basically the total amount of meat on the planet. When the agricultural revolution happened in our distant past, when we decided that we would stop throwing spears at things and have plots of land and grow vegetables and have uh, livestock, that sort of thing, uh, this rough estimation of about how much meat was on the planet in terms of vertebrate biomass was this. Now this is what it is today. So most of the meat on the planet is cattle, followed by us. We're the second highest biomass on the planet, and so on and so forth down the track. Now you'll notice what's happened to the wild. They've come down here. But, but Corey, how can you have that biomass then and that biomass there? Well, of course, that is our wonderful, or tragic, depending on your perspective, engineering capacity and our ability to suck productivity out of the ground by using agriculture to create more meat. Now, of course, a lot of that meat is also croplands feeding these things. I like to think, I like to call this slide one of the scariest slides in the world. This is uh, work from the World Wildlife Foundation uh, updated last year from uh, censuses of over uh, 12,000 different populations of vertebrates, so uh, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, and amphibians. The total number of individuals in those populations representing about 5,000 different species. Census since the 1970s, so if you zero the clock at 1970, of course there were damages before that, it measures how much populations on average have declined. Since my, the year of my birth, 1970, we have lost 60% of the vertebrate individuals on the planet. And you can see that's a fairly good coverage of the planet. Of course, it's not perfect, but it does represent a pretty good um, overview of where we are. Now, extinction is the death of the last individual in a species. This is the precursor because we have reduction in population size, then we lose populations, and eventually we lose the species entirely. This is also one of the scariest slides in the world, so I, I tend not to rank them. This is, and you may have heard of this in the last few months, the, the so-called insectageddon, uh, the loss of invertebrates. And uh, this has really surprised a lot of people, mainly because we don't tend to measure invertebrates that well. 
Uh, there's so many of them and they're hard to standardize and control and get really good time series. This is a time series of flying insect biomass in, in Germany from the 1990s up to the present with a 75% reduction in, fly, in flying insect biomass in that one country. Um, this is Puerto Rico going back about this back to the 70s with up to 99% reductions in much of the uh, forest invertebrates. Uh, it doesn't end there. The UK, uh, both bees, uh, different bee species, native bee species, and sawfly species, which are major pollinators, have reduced on average by about half. And there are other questionable trends out there. But these are the first real inkling that our invertebrates are starting to disappear. Now I'll talk a little bit more what the implications for that are um, as we get into the farther into the talk. Now this is that's all the stuff that's been happening with the, the killing, the agriculture, the forest, the deforestation. Now we have to deal with this. So I, I like to show this. It's a nice little representation. Every decade that passes, you get a snapshot of the distribution of global temperatures and a frequency distribution. So the anomaly basically is uh, from the 1951 to 1980 average. And you can see as we get closer to the present how that distribution is shifting. Not only is it shifting to the right, so getting positive, look at the shape of the distribution. It's getting spread out and, and, and what we call platycurtic in statistical um, jargon. It's getting wider extremes. This is another way to look at it. Um, I really like this one because uh, if anyone ever tells you that, uh, I, I think few people today actually say, oh, it's not getting warmer because you know you have to be blind not to see this. They might say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. Well, that's also bullshit. But this, this, is really, this is only goes up to 2017. It's continuing. <laughs> it just shows you the magnitude of the change. In fact, we are putting into the Earth's atmosphere the equivalent energy of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs every single day. That's what the Earth is absorbing in terms of the extra anthropogenic uh, greenhouse effect and trapping that energy in the Earth system. 400,000 Hiroshima bombs per day. Well, obviously, there are repercussions for that. If you took at the total ice cover on the Antarctic continent, and you separated it between two these two periods, this 20 years here and the 20 years there, the melt rate in the second half of this time series is 280% higher than it was in the first half. Okay. We're probably a little bit more familiar with what's happening in the Arctic, even though it's farther away, because more research has been done. Just showing you sea ice extent, such that within the next 10 to 15 years, the probability of total ice loss during the summer, late summer, is pretty much 100%. We already have the uh, opening of the Northwest Passage, but we're gonna have total ice loss for the first time within the next decade or so. Now, a lot of people need more convincing than that. So I'm gonna give you a primary statistics. You're all gonna be a lot smarter when you leave this place, okay? So what we do uh, in statistics is we measure something. In this case, let's measure the maximum daily temperature in a given location. This is roughly an Adelaide kind of climate, okay? And every day around three o'clock, you take your maximum temperature, sometimes it's a little bit later, sometimes a bit earlier, and you measure that and you put it in a bin. These are in two degree bins. So this is maybe 100 years worth of data. In fact, Adelaide's um, temperature record goes back to 1887. Uh, and every day you just uh, measure, and this is the frequency, the number of days that you're within that temperature bin for the maximum daily temperature. That's just a histogram, right? Then we fit what's called a probability density function to that. Now, that's the formula there for a Gaussian distribution, which you don't need to know. I'll test you on this later. Uh, but basically, all that's doing is fitting a function to that histogram such that the area under the curve is sums to one. Remember your integral calculus from high school? Probably not, but that's, that's what it does. Now, in a perfectly normal distribution, bell curve Gaussian distribution, the mean and median are the same. In this case, it's the, the, the half of the distribution is to the left, half is it to right, and this is the median temperature, mean temperature over that entire time series. If we want to um, look at the probability of a particular temperature 
are rising, what we do then is we take, let's say that we call this a heat wave. Anything 35 degrees and above, we'll call a heat wave. Maybe now we'll call that 40, but it doesn't matter. It's a little bit arbitrary. The area under that curve now, which is 2% of the total area here, is the probability of achieving 35 degrees or beyond. So in this case, there's a 2% chance at any given day of the year that you're going to exceed uh, 34.99 degrees. Okay, now let's move the entire distribution over just a little bit, a couple degrees. Doesn't sound like a lot. You can see it doesn't really do a lot to the mean over here. A few more days with the barbecue at the end of the summer, uh, better growing season. What's the problem? Well, the problem is this. It's not a linear relationship. So that when you shift that distribution slightly this way, you more than double the probability of that extreme event occurring. Now, in ecology, in medicine, in climate, Nothing is driven by the mean. It's driven by the extreme events. What kills the red, red, uh, red river gums? It's the extreme heat waves. What kills the immunocompromised and elderly people and young people in heat waves? What, hap what, what knocks out power networks, as we're all familiar with in South Australia? It's the extreme events. Let's get worse. Let's, let's do it by four, uh, four degrees now. Now, you've got from a one in 50, one in 50 year event, essentially, or one in a 1 50th, 0 0.02, to now one in nine. Now let's, let's go back to remember the, the, the curve before for the world temperatures were getting a bit flatter and spread out like someone squished down that distribution. Let's add that in. And now with the same temperature degree change that we had in the initial, now we're up to about one in eight. In other words, the frequency of, of extreme events plus their intensity is getting higher and higher. So basically we're knocking things on the head and not giving them the time to recover and then knocking them on the head again. And that's what drives populations down. A meta-analysis in 2015 was put forward looking at um, about 400 different studies predicting the, the effect of mostly single species changes and total extinction rates based on different um, uh, concentration pathways for emissions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, representative concentration pathways. This is what we're tracking. Well, actually, we're tracking beyond this. This is the worst case scenario right here for the IPCC. We're above that. Uh, we're looking at, you know, between 10 and 15 percent if you just go on sort of the single species predictions. However, it's unfortunate. And, you know, these are things like, oh, um, flying foxes falling out of trees and heat waves, which has happened in Adelaide. It's worse than that. Now, I want to point out this fellow here, who's Giovanni Strona, who's visiting us from Italy, visiting Flinders right now. Uh, this is work that he led, uh, we published last year. He's the real brains behind this outfit. Uh, and it, it came about from a, um, uh, a paper that was published the year before, looking at the um, physiological robustness of what we call tardigrades. Everyone's heard of tardigrades before, water bears sort of almost microscopic invertebrates that have the coolest looking mouth parts and they're cute and cuddly little things. They're, they're everywhere, they're in every environment. But you can fry them, you can bake them, you can freeze them, you can shoot them into space and they just keep coming back. They're amazing little things. The whole point of this paper was that, oh, you know, we might all go extinct, but at least there'll be life. And that was just looking at the physiological t or thermal tolerances of these wonderful little beasts. However, Ecologists like ourselves said, hmm, that doesn't actually make sense because no species lives in a vacuum, right? We're all connected to other species. We eat things, they eat us. Uh, herbivores eat grass, bees pollinate flowers, so on and so forth. Everything's connected in an ecosystem. So we asked the question by, by what, do, doing what we did, uh, what are called ecological networks that link species together. We looked at by pushing the temperature up, or cooling it down, so this could be like an asteroid impact or a nuclear war, what would the additional effect of what we call co-extinctions be on the total extinction rate? So if you have a, a loss of a species from exceeding its thermal tolerances, and then the species that depend on that species thus going extinct because they, the, their dependency is no longer there. It turns out that in the heating scenario in particular, you underestimate the extinction rates by about 10 times. Now. 
it's even when we when we when Giovanni showed me these first results. I mean, I'm a pessimist at the best of times. This really depressed me. <laughs> uh, it gets worse because we did very scenarios. We took the networks and we said, okay, let's take the most important species in those networks, the ones that are connected the best and have the most importance in terms of the cascading effects through the system. And we knock out the most important species first, and then we knock out the next most important species, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's that's the line you get here the pink line. Now we did random removals, we did the cooling scenario, and then we did um, the, the warming as well. What is amazing is that the warming scenario pretty much mimics the worst case scenario for extinctions. In other words, extinctions from climate change are guaranteed and they are the worst possible suite that you could possibly imagine if you were the sort of the omnipotent and omniscient being that could kill off a planet really fast, that's how you do it. Well, heating does the same thing. Okay, now a lot of my work has focused over the years on human populations. As an ecologist, I said, well, it's just another population. Why not model humans as well? Uh, that was a mistake um, because when I published this paper, my first real uh, delving into uh, human demography, I got death threats, I got... Um, all sorts of, uh, you talk about um, trolls on the internet. Oh my God, did I cop it? I even had to take the dress off of my website so people couldn't find my, um, my office. Uh, fortunately, none of that came to pass. People take their breeding rights very seriously and there's culture and religion and everything else wrapped up into that. Now, the UN initially had sort of about five years ago had a massive range. We could potentially peak this century or we could blow out to about 16 billion by the end of the century. They've since revised that, uh, basically saying there's no chance for a peak in the total world population this century. And we, we did something a little bit different. We did a more what's called a deterministic model simply because it's, it's, um, it's a little bit easier to test scenarios. Now we did what most human demographers will never do. We started tweaking the system to see what if would happen. Because I'd often get at the end of a talk, sort of say, well, if the population was lower, then it would all be good because humans are bad. We just need to have fewer people. True, but how fast does that work? Okay, well, let's look at some scenarios. Okay, let's say that uh, we achieve worldwide one child average per woman by the end of this century. So a worldwide one child policy a la China. Will never happen. But let's just say for shits and giggles that that's what happens. Well, it turns out that in the end of the, uh, the century, you're gonna have just as many people alive as you do today. So in a ridiculous scenario that would never happen, very little change. Now let's say that we somehow were able to avoid all the unintended um, births out there. So in 2008, there were 208 million pregnancies. Uh, 86 million of those were unintended. Um, we all know how that works. Um, 11 million of those were miscarried. The 41 million were aborted. This is worldwide, of course. Uh, 33 million uh, ended up in an unplanned birth. Uh, I'm a good example of that, and so is my daughter. If you have that scenario where you um, avoid this part through family planning, not coercion or anything, I'm not suggesting any of that, uh, you essentially have the same kind of outcome as a worldwide one-child policy. Okay, now this is where we get a little bit evil. You can probably see the resemblance. So we, this is where we really started to go over the top. So let's say that you double infant mortality over the next century. Food, crop failures, extreme events, child mortality doubles worldwide. Top line there is the business as usual. This is what happens. Okay, let's say you take all the deaths from the First World War all the deaths from the Spanish flu, which killed a lot more people than the actual war did, and all the deaths from the Second World War lumped them together as a proportion of people alive in 1940. And you have a Third World War lasting about five years, four or five years, um, roughly in the middle of the century. This is what you get. Okay, now let's say you take SARS, SARS and you take Ebola and you mix it with swine flu and then you spread it around the world a la 12 monkeys and you have 2 billion people die in the space of five years from a massive global pandemic. 
that's how many people you have alive at the end of the century. Okay, now let's say India and Pakistan finally have Jack and they push the buttons and, and Russia and America and, and Kim Jong is, pushes the buttons and kills everyone else and six billion people die in, in five years. In other words, we're not going anywhere very fast, no matter what happens, at least over the course of the next century. Of course, that's, that's, this is global. Now, let's look at particular areas. In fact, the, the region of the world that's going to see the highest increases in human population is Africa. Right now, the entire continent is just shy of uh, half a billion people. It will be rising between five and seven times over the course of the century to achieve about three billion people. Why is that? Well, unlike Latin America and Asia, through their main development periods, the fertility per woman declined precipitously, which is a normal sort of expectation for increasing per capita wealth. That's not really happening in Africa. While it is declining, and has declined a little bit, nothing near the rates that it has, we've seen in other developing parts of the world. In fact, in many countries in Africa today, it's stagnated entirely. So these are pretty much guaranteed to occur. Now this is a photo I took in the Kruger National Park back in 2016. I like to pretend that I actually intended this, but it was late in the evening, I'm a shitty photographer, but the light was just right. I call this the ghost rhino. These are the poaching statistics for the best financed, the best protected, and one of the largest national parks in Africa. On average, two, it only goes up to 2016 September, that's why it's here. Uh, those are the data I had. Are not, on average, two white rhino per day are being poached from that park. So, in other words, considering the advancement of the human population there uh, and uh, all the other stresses everywhere else is achieving, if you haven't been to Africa yet and seen these wonderful beasts, I suggest you do it soon. And I'm not being facetious when I say that. What about little old Australia? Well, Australia has a completely different... Um, or opposite side of the coin in terms of population demography because most of our growth, and we're averaging about 1% per year, is from a net immigration rate of about two, just over 200,000 people per year. You can tell from my accent clearly that I was a net immigrant as well. Uh, and if we continued on that same immigration line, we'd achieve about 90 million by the end of the century. But if, for example, if we closed all the doors and let no more immigrants in, of course, that's a ridiculous scenario too, just, just for scenario purposes, we'd essentially peak within the next five to 10 years. In other words, almost all of our growth is from immigration, similar to places like uh, many parts of Western Europe. Um, and J Japan is going down mainly because they don't take in a lot of <laughs> immigrants. So people say, okay, well, Corey, it's not all about population, clearly. It's about consumption. Absolutely. But they're so intertwined, it's like arguing whether the length or the width of a rectangle contributes more to its area. You can't separate these two processes. Now, yes, it's true that consumption in some areas is, can be reduced more than, say, we would have to focus attention on demography, but they are intrinsically um, related. This shows some information uh, for a handful of uh, developed nations, you can see them there, and the net effect of making some individual choices in your life on your total carbon footprint. Now, I want to take focus your attention here. The choice of not having one extra child is 58 times the highest contribution of any other major decision you can make regarding how you live your life. If you're a vegetarian, that's great, but it's nothing like having a kid, okay, and so on and forth. Living car-free, avoiding transatlantic flights, I'm the biggest hypocrite there, and many of my academic colleagues are the same, something I'm trying to work on. <laughs> but it, it just comes down, in terms of Western living lifestyles, by far and away, the biggest thing you do is avoid breeding. It's pushed the Earth in, into an ecological deficit. Now, this is the ecological footprint. You can actually go to the website here and check out your own footprint or your regional footprint. It's essentially how many of the Earth's resources that we're using beyond the renewable rate. So right now, it's considered uh, that on average, we're using about 1.6 Earths per year. How is that possible? Well, think about it this way. Let's say that you have a bank account, and there's $10,000 in it. And every year, 
I take out, uh, I put in $1,000, okay? But during the course of that year, I spend $2,000 living, doing whatever. I know that's very small amounts of money, but let's just, <laughs> for example purposes. So I take out more than I put in. Eventually, your bank account is going to run dry. We're living on borrowed time right now. Yes, we've managed to increase our carrying capacity through technological innovation and agriculture and so on and so forth over the last 12,000 years, but we've run out of time. Now, when things start to crash, and there's evidence that things are crashing already, as I've shown you from many of the extinction, uh, the extinction data is another question. Now, getting back to our invertebrates, what does it mean for us? 90% of all flowering plants need some form of animal pollination and about 80% of our crop species, which means globally about one in every three spoonfuls of food is due to an animal pollinator. Half of that is from one species. Guesses? Honeybees, yeah. Not even a native to Australia. So uh, apologies to the younger members of the audience. Uh, this is this couldn't be truer, <laughs> and this I, I sort of get a little bit upset when people say, you know, what does extinction mean? Does it mean we're we're going to reduce our chances of finding a cure for cancer? No, no, no. It's much, 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 much worse than that. Our entire life support system depends so much, very much, on these small species that we take for granted. Some other examples. Some work I did back in 2007. Between 1990 and 2000, now well, this is going back a bit now. There, about 100,000 people died globally from massive floods. 320 million people were displaced and total reported damages of 1.1 trillion US dollars. That was 20 years ago. We looked at uh, around the developing world the relationship between flooding frequency and duration and native forest cover. And we of course controlled for things like slope and precipitation, soil moisture and things like that. And basically came up with this. Flood frequency and duration, the things that really count when you're talking about the damages um, associated with a flooding event, are intrinsically related to the total forest cover. Recent work that came out last month showed that a 1% uh, increase in deforestation decreases access to clean drinking water by about a percent. This is, this is data from Mali. You can see if you don't know where Mali is, that's, there it is there. Malawi, sorry, not Mali. Malawi, Mali's up here. <laughs> um, and you can see the deforestation that's occurred there. So counterintuitively you think, okay, fewer forests, more runoff, but it creates fires and it does it. And a lot of that runoff goes into the sea. I've done doing a lot of work recently on the African environmental thing. I've, I've turned a lot of my attention to Africa for various reasons. We took uh, a combined uh, metric of ecological footprint and the capacity to conserve large species, proportion of red, uh, threatened species, water extraction, uh, deforestation, livestock, croplands and emissions, and basically ranked countries in Africa according to their environmental footprint. The greener countries here being a little bit better off than the other ones. Now, when you look at that, the strongest predictor of internation inter differences in environmental performance was human population density. Globally, it's GDP, but in Africa, it's population density. And you can see that this distribution of people in Africa now. What does that mean? Well, we took this similar concept. I'm working with a lot of uh, child health experts these days. And we took the incidence of stunting. These are national scale data. Uh, uh, pulmonary diseases, respiratory diseases, diarrheal diseases, infectious diseases and injuries. Did the same sort of thing. And then compared them to various uh, predictors. Uh, I won't go through the details of all this, but the three things that come out, GDP, the richer countries, the kids are better off. They're not dying as much, they're not as burdened with disease. Next is clean water and sanitation services. Household size, which is a proxy for density. And then number four was environment. The very same metric that I showed you in the previous slides. In other words, and so on and so forth. These were the strongest predictors by far. These make sense, but food supply and air pollution, while they do have a very strong effect, are much less important these days than they were 50 years ago in Africa. Climate change is set 
to reduce yields of most crops. Recent work here shows that about a 6% um, fall in uh, wheat, global wheat production for every degree of warming worldwide. Yet, because of the population growth, we're going to essentially have to double our crop production because the, uh, the production will have to outpace growth in the developing world until it catches up with us, hopefully with not the same consumption footprint. If you took all the water in the world and put it in a little bubble, a little bowl like this, that's what it would look like. However, 97.5% of that is salt water. So this is all the fresh water in the world. 67% of that is frozen. Well, not for very much longer, mind. That's what's available to the humans. About 1% of all the world, world's water is available to us. Uh, just to comparison-wise, that's how Australia, roughly the same size as the continental US. Globally, we are in dire straits. We live in the world's driest inhabited continent, yet we use, and I'll show you later, here, six times the global average in water use. We are superlative water wasters. A lot of this is industrial, of course, too. But let's just look at it from, forget the carbon footprint side of it. Let's just look at the water footprint. So let's take an average steak meal at the pub. The steak, and that's probably a small steak for most people, nearly 5,000 liters. 5,500 liters for a potato, 360 for a bottle of wine, sliced bread, a couple of lettuce. 5,000 liters for your standard steak dinner. Now, why aren't people freaking out? This is something that's bothered me for a long time. So I delved a little bit into the psychology literature, and this is a really sort of pivotal book that was written um, about 20 years ago, looking at what they call the denial of death. So this quote, just, the, the terror, is to have emerged from nothing, to have a name, a consciousness, a sense of self, a deep inner feelings, yearning for life, and for all this yet to die. We, we will end, we are not forever. We manage this terror by subscribing to culturally constructed beliefs about reality and life and nature and gives us a sense that we're valuable in a meaningful universe. Extend this to the death of the planet. Colleague Solomon um, about in 1991 called this the terror management theory. We are highly motivated to maintain confidence in the veracity of our cultural worldview and faith that we're valuable people. So whenever one is threatened, we respond defensively to bolster our faith in our culture and ourselves because the existential threat, the death of everyone, amplifies the denial and the defense that we see for our very own existence. Nothing could demonstrate that better than a parent and how they defend their children. The idea that no matter what you do for your children, no matter what investment you put in, no matter what you give them, that they are still just as threatened as the people next door is unfathomable to most people. How can I, as a parent, justify giving everything if it's for naught? So I choose, in fact, to deny it. This is another existential denial. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about population dynamics because you're going to learn stuff today. Let's say you have a population and you measure it at sort of intermittent intervals. And this is our notation, the little carrot there suggests it's an estimated size, it's very difficult to count every single individual in a population. We usually have estimates. And the T just denotes at one time. And let's say you do that over, let's say years, every one of these is a year. So that's year one, year two, year three, could be months, doesn't matter. You take the ratio of time, sorry, I got this back to front, t, and T to NT plus, I want to call that lambda. And we do that for second and so on. And then we change that on the logarithmic scale, we call that R, the growth rate. We call that the exponential growth rate. We do that and so on and so forth. For example, let's say you uh, increase from five individuals to 10 individuals um, and that meet, sorry, you decrease. I've got this back to front, I'm sorry. Um, you, you decrease by 0.69. If you increase, there's your rate of increase. If you plot these on a, um, just a bivariate graph, you take the R, which is that ratio on the log scale against the, the population size at time T, so bigger populations here, smaller here. The 
points above the line are increasing populations for that time interval, and the, below the line of zero is decreasing. Now, if you've got a relationship between there, which means that as you grow bigger, your population rate of increase declines, the point at which it crosses the zero line is what we call the carrying capacity. How much of that environment can uh, support that number of individuals? Now, as it turns out, if there's a negative relationship here, if you find yourself beyond the line, you tend to be drawn back to this equilibrium point. Okay? Meaning that if you're beyond, uh, if you have a large population size, things constrain the performance of individuals. Their fitness goes down and they tend to be drawn, the entire population tends to be drawn back to this equilibrium point. Similarly, if you're below the line, you've got a lot of per capita resources and you do well. You breed a lot, you, you, know, you, do, you have shelter, you have access to food, so on and so forth. And you tend to bump that back towards the equilibrium. This is a huge area that needs to be developed. We've started to go down these lines. The idea is that high densities, and we've seen some data already, some of my own, showing that the rise of tribalism and territoriality, protectionism of resources is a strong function of increasing population density. And we've seen this no better demonstration as the rise of populism and extreme views. And I contend that if we're going, if, uh, given that we are increasing our population and that's inevitable and our resources are dwindling, we're gonna see more of this, not less. In Africa alone, for every one percent rise in population growth, there is, um, uh, let me just find my numbers here, for every one percent rise, there's a three to five times increase in the number of refugees produced. Now, in 19, um, 19 sorry, 2015, we had an average of about 24 people displaced from their homes every minute of the day which means that about 35,000 people have been displaced and some, uh, you could call them refugees, around the world. Now, most of that um, is in Syria uh, or in the Middle East. Um, sorry, most come from Africa, but with the rising uh, instability in the Middle East producing quite a bit, which means that if you took this to the extension of the number of people that will be around in Africa at the end of the century, you're looking between 80 and 120 million refugees produced annually from Africa alone, forgetting climate change and forgetting unforeseen wars. So if you think we have a refugee problem now, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, I've been doing a lot of work. Um, we're writing a book. It's when I first met Giovanni, in fact. Uh, we're calling this Jigsaw Utopia. This is with Paul Ehrlich looking at various aspects of society where we're basically looking at the performance of countries in terms of equality, um, gender and racial equality, uh, financial equality, health, uh, agriculture, uh, environmental performance, and so on and so on. Long story short, every region that we've looked at, the countries that are doing better in all of these categories are the ones with the lowest population densities. Botswana in Africa. Uh, a lot of the northern African countries are doing better than their um, sub-Saharan counterparts. Uruguay, um, Namibia, um, places where they don't have the same pressure on their resources. So the take home, no, this is not the take home message. <laughs> this is not the answer. This is how a lot of us end up feeling, but there's a lot we can do. So I'm gonna finish off very shortly was just some of the ideas, and we can discuss these in the panel more um, in more depth. These are the state investment in the environment. Uh, state of South Australia, since 2002, I pulled these out of the budget papers. Not a fun job, but don't recommend anyone doing it. Uh, if we have any, want any hope of regenerating or protecting what we have left in terms of our environment, we have to do a lot better about putting money into that portfolio and not having it be, you know, the, 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 the ugly, stupid cousins portfolio, which it has been both nationally and at the state level. We need to fix our broken legislation. We have a lot of legislation that can be circumvented, and this is environmental protection in my head. The EPBC Act, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, is uh, an archaic system that doesn't actually lead to protection of biodiversity. 
and it needs an overhaul. It is being addressed, but it's we're far from it. We need to go from, um, you know, really biting uh, to these toothless policies to really biting policies. I talked about children. Now, if you've already bred, don't go off and sacrifice your children. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. <laughs> but there's a growing movement around the world of women choosing not to reproduce. Uh, in fact, until climate change ends, they're going to be waiting a bit. Um, but there, this is something, you know, as a, as a middle-aged white man from a wealthy country, I'm the last person on earth to tell people what they should and shouldn't do. And obviously, I've copped a lot of flack for that. But it's a serious consideration. Coercion and, and the idea of control and all that is not what we're talking about. We need to re-implement family planning, access to health care, giving women rights and uh, financial autonomy and equality in every respect to make their own decisions because for too long it's been dictated by men. And that's half or 90% of the problem. We have an ICAC here in South Australia. I don't actually know very much about it. We have the suggestion of one that's coming up in the federal election, sorry, in the federal, um, the federal sense, but it's kind of a toothless beast at the moment. We need independent oversight of our political process. But more importantly, we need to take the money out of politics. Now, I know um, <laughs> certain members of our audience probably don't want to necessarily hear that because that's how our system works. It's based on if you've got money, you can make the advertisements, you can do the campaigns, and you can reach out to people. There are grassroots movements that are showing that's not necessarily always the case. But we need to not just make our political donations transparent. We need to severely limit them. Otherwise, we don't have a democracy. We have a plutocracy. And we will never win the war with companies calling the shots where their only consideration is the bottom line. We never, we hardly ever hear about the state of things going on in the regular news. We hear about the sports statistics. We hear about, maybe we get a bit about the weather. This just came out last week. The Guardian is putting now CO2 uh, uh, concentrations on their weather forecast. But that's not even close enough. The GDP, which is our common metric, you hear about you know, growth rates, the economy's growing, the economy's declining. GDP is even a bad economist's bad idea of how to measure the economy. Uh, for example, if you have an oil spill, your GDP goes up. But if you grow tomatoes in your garden, not counted. Okay? There are actually better indicators out there. This thing is just one, the Genuine Progress Indicator, which basically shows that for the countries measured, only 17 countries so far, from about 1977, 1978, world wealth has actually been going down. Now, this is, this is what they call um, an environmental uh, discount on the wealth component. In other words, it's forecasting into the future what we're going to be losing from the environmental footprint that we already have. In other words, our, our economies are not growing. They're declining. So we could report this. Uh, we could do just the CO2, yeah, but we could do much more. We could do something like the proportion of th species threatened over time. The, this, the global uh, genuine progress indicator is a measure of the health of our, of our wealth, if you will. We could go uh, look at the proportion of area protected in our country. We could do things like the Gini index, which is the, the measure of the, uh, the quality of wealth, the distribution of the poor and the rich. Um, and how many of the rich people have most of the money and how many of the poor people have next to nothing. These are very good measures that we have at all sorts of scales. And lastly, my daughter didn't make it tonight, but we need to say something. Now, this is my daughter who was at the um, climate strike um, last month, and I've joined the sorry, I've gone too far. I've joined the uh, Extinction Rebellion, which you may have heard about a little bit uh, in the news, especially yesterday. A few people got tossed out. Uh, no one was hurt very much, as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we need to make a loud voice. All of us. It's no longer a, a, a situation. I'm an empirical scientist, and my, 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 my ilk are usually of the opinion that our job is to sit back and provide the data and let people work it out. I don't think we're able to do that any longer. I think we need to voice our concerns in as, as logical and as uh, eloquently as possible, but we need to do this as well. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. So I'm going to leave you there. I think I've slightly gone over time. Um, I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank Flinders University, Alistair, and uh, certainly my panel, who you'll be meeting very shortly, and uh, this wonderful opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much.
fascinating. Uh, so we have assembled a panel, and so uh, to introduce the panel, so we have Dr. Susan Close, who is the MP and State Member for Port Adelaide and Deputy Leader of the Opposition and Shadow Minister for Education, Environment and Water, correct? Professor Chris Daniels, who is the director of the Cleveland uh, Wildlife Park. <laughs> we have this uh, Emily Jenke, who is the co CEO of Democracy Cup. <laughs> this uh, Sophie Poston, who is one of our uh, model undergraduates from, from Flinders University. Oh, do I have to sit there too? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, and that was, um, I kind of want to hug you and I kind of want to smack you. For, <laughs> it, was, it was just brilliant and succinct and uh, utterly truthful and therefore depressing. Um, that's the, the question of, of the interaction between all of these issues in politics is a really difficult and complex one, and I'm not going to be able to give you uh, a full answer and do it quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll go for the latter. Uh, but the... This is a, a, an issue of the urgency and scale that politics, um, democratic politics, isn't particularly well designed to deal with. Um, we are very good at incremental, what we like to think of as improvement, and we are very good at the occasional punctuated change. Um, we can suddenly, under extreme pressure from a First World War uh, and a depression uh, decide that a welfare state's a good idea. And that was a magnificent and huge change. And it took uh, a lot of political courage and it took a lot of money and it made a very big difference. What we're talking about is far bigger than that. It, we're talking about really pushing against the entire direction of the way in which our economy and society is structured and our cultural beliefs uh, and our personal lifestyle choices and practices. Now, that's not to say that we haven't made enormous changes, uh, and, and there's a lot of reason to be hopeful in that sense. I don't think it's fast enough, but there, you know, the technological changes in favour of um, reducing climate emissions and so on. So, politics. Um, so, we find it hard to make really big decisions that push against um, the majority expectation. So, if you want us to do things, you need to educate us as a class. The political class needs to understand this deeply. And you need to tell us what to do. And uh, Corey gave us some at the end, some examples of what can be done. I suspect they're nowhere near enough. Uh, and yet they're pitched at the right level for what we're actually capable of in, in the immediate term. I think we need to raise the temperature, ironically, uh, dramatically on politics in Australia and globally. Um, I don't think that any politician should be out and about without hearing from people about inaction on climate change and inaction on biodiversity loss. I want to hear it when I knock on doors. I want to hear it when I'm in a shopping centre. And um, to do that, you need to get the general population understanding this as well. And they've gone a long way in climate change and they're a lot further ahead than our federal government is, the general population, but they're not there on biodiversity. Um, so, you know, there are, there are those of us who who get it and want to do stuff and are enthusiastic and you know but if you want really big change it's got to be all of us it's got to be both sides it's got to last past elections and so we need to take this um seriously collectively if we want to see politicians make the really deep differences and, and for that very grateful that you came tonight <laughs> i mean that's a that's a that's a wonderful demonstration of that but i guess i want to i want to throw that back just before oh it's not am i not on Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, I just, do you think things like the, the recent um, climate strike and, and the Extinction Rebellion, um, things that went on yesterday, 
Uh, is that getting noticed? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure yesterday got noticed quite as much as it should have been, partly because it was not a sitting week, so the very few people who knew about... But put that one aside. That climate strike, or those climate strikes, are magnificent. And, uh, I, you know, that day was just such a day, wasn't it, the most recent one, because there were thousands of kids there, and it was so positive and exciting. And then, of course, the news started to filter through about what had happened in, in Christchurch. And you just remember, God, we're a difficult species. We're capable of enormous uh, good, and um, we're capable of enormous evil. Uh, but I think... That it will be heard, that climate strike will be heard. The young generation, they're going, they're going to start voting soon and sensible politicians think, oh, perhaps I should be trying to be attractive. However, and, I, and I'm truly not trying to play a political game here, but I was genuinely disappointed that the government here said, oh, no, they should be at school. I really thought that was out of step with... And for God's sake, the kids who were there, they... They're, they're doing fine at school. They were great, intelligent, far-sighted kids. And give me a break, two or three hours out of school versus uh, standing up for your future. Uh, but that, that disappointed me because, I, you, as I said, you, it has to be bipartisan ultimately. You can't have this, what we've had with energy. It's, it's this policy, then it's that policy, then it's this policy. We can't do that. We've got to take it off the table. And uh, I, I think the young people are the ones who will drive us there. I hate that northern hemisphere, even though I'm originally from there. I don't like looking at the map with that. They're top. No. <laughs> it's a little bit of adjusting. <laughs> so we're a long way from uh, everywhere else. Uh, so does it really matter what we do here in South Australia if it's uh, under 2 million population? Thank you for that, Alistair. Could you actually hear me without using this weapon of mass destruction? I think I might leave that one down there. It's a fabulous question, and it's one that we get all the time. Only 1.2 or 1.3 million people. What does it matter given that China has 1 million, India 1.2 million, or the other way around? And the answer is it actually matters more than in India or China because we sit here in a state uh, the size of Western Europe, a country that's the size of continental United States, with what is arguably a world status, the, the most educated, the most resourced population that you can have. Um, and in a state with the access to the greatest amount of resources from so many different sources of that other countries just dream about the sort of actions um, and availabilities that, that we have here. We can even turn seawater into fresh water if we want to. And we're only one of the So if we can't do it with all the resources that we have and all the resources available to us and all of this opportunity to be a world leader to show the world how to do it, to test new technologies, to test new cultural um, and economic approaches, then how could we ask China or India to do it? And we are really ducking our responsibility to be, um, have, to be, or to have access to all these resources if we don't even try to show some sort of restraint and control and implement really good processes. So I think we are morally obligated to be a world leader, not to pull back. The second reason is that if we do nothing, that allows bad people to have free run. And we are doing nothing, and so people then come in and go, hey, we're only South Australia, let's clear all the crops. Less than 8% of remnant vegetation remains in our box. Let's overgraze, let's overuse the water to help with the fish and the Murray garlic. Doesn't matter, we should be able to do it because our so again, doing nothing allows bad people to do something. Um, and the final reason is, it's straight out good for us. So we can park all of Corey's argument about biodiversity for its own sake and just go, we must be doing it because it's really important for our health and well-being and for that of our children. We know that we benefit personally from spending time outside of the forest. It's great for us physiologically, it's great for us in terms of our mental health and stability, and it's particularly great for us in terms of creating societal strength and sense of community, engagement and positivism. So we now know that without an environmental influence and construct and connectivity, societies fall apart, people become miserable, they die young, and kids become disenfranchised and form gangs and spend all their time playing without 
up war games on the computer and everything on the other side. So it's a whole mass of reasons why it's good for us. And I've just been in New Zealand recently, which as a country has realised they have gone too far. And there is a measure of panic in New Zealand now about the fact that their entire fabric and existence is at not only genuine risk, it's probably already severely damaged because they've wasted their water, because they've overcleared, um, because they haven't managed their resources, because their biodiversity is, is such that most of their key species are down to tens to hundreds of individuals, whether it be kiwi or takahe, of exports falls away. So their whole social fabric is teetering on the brink right now because they've realised they've gone too far for the damage to their environment. So those are the three reasons why we should do it. Perhaps <laughs> wouldn't it be great to be a world leader? We absolutely could nail it. Well, moving on to South <laughs> So South Australia, that's 1.2 million. I'm a busy person. I've got a uh, demanding lifestyle. We were talking earlier, you've got uh, children. And so, amongst all of that, we're juggling all of that. What can I do to possibly reduce my technological All right. So, I think it's really important. A lot of people speak to me about. Not, not feeling like they're making much difference. They're not having much of an impact. They can only do so much. It's up to the government to do something. Why should we bother? Um, I think it's really important to do those small things, to share those small things, to speak about those small things, to, to even just as a community building sense of, hey, we're actually trying. Some of us here are really giving it a good go. So. I think things like being mindful of your use of resources, reducing your meat consumption, buying things secondhand from the op shop or, or choosing to vote with your money about the companies that you pay for things, making sure that you check out which, um, which companies that you buy from are, are ecologically friendly, are, have, have a small impact on um, other human populations, are, are ethical. Um, I think for me, educating people about it in any way that I can. There's, there's an informal sort of education that I have with my friends, with the people that I meet, where I speak about the coal stickies, for example, and what a complete waste of everything that they are. Um, and that's actually, those small conversations have changed the minds of our friends, so they don't use them, they don't, they don't create a market for those sort of things. I think speaking to your friends and family about, you know, I have children, they, they get gifts. And, you know, my mum is, is a brilliant one for giving experiences rather than plastic crap that just piles up with the rest of the other plastic crap, like speaking like that. And then in a, in a situation and in a space where you are educated about this, to share that knowledge, not in a judgmental way, not in telling everyone that they're doing the wrong thing, but in an encouraging way to try to build that community, build that support and speak about the easy little things that you can do to start making a difference. I'll do the mic. Um, I've got a loud farm voice too. Um, so, yeah, great to be here tonight. And um, and it's kind of interesting. I sort of see this, listen to Corey through two lenses and the two hats that I wear, one which is um, the business that I run, which is trying to get governments to work better with communities and bring people into policy making, not just money and political, you know, and influence. Um so, you know, we sort of call it raising the citizen's voice, you know, bringing the citizenship into existence instead of just having the people with the decision makers that have the money and the power. Um, so that's part of what I do. But the other part of what I do is that I'm the presiding member of the Native Veg, Native, the South Australian Native Vegetation Council. And um, we have quite a dilemma as a, as a board and um, it, we're constantly thinking about how do we make good decisions that protect 
what we've got, at least protect what we've got, hopefully put a little bit back in and maybe, you know, maybe try and influence some behaviours. And I thought I might just tell you the, a bit of a, uh, a scary story and a bit of a good story as some examples of, of what's possible. Um, you might have heard about a really big motorsport park down in um, in Tail and Bend, which was, and uh, Susan and I have had a chat about this, I have had a chat with a number of people about it, which was was built and expanded in the last few years. Um, one of the ways in which that development came to pass was that there are ways around legislation. There are, you know, you can cut corners. If you've got enough money and enough influence and you can make the case strongly enough about the jobs you'll create and get the attention of a government, you can go around even the strongest laws. And even though our South Australian native vegetation laws are not that strong, they're probably some of the strongest in the country, I'd say. Um, and we were unable to have even the slightest impact on the scale of that development. Oops, my and screen saver you know, started. Thousands of, you know, <laughs> thousands of hectares of, or hundreds of hectares of 600-year-old um, Mallee box were cleared on that site. Um, our alternative with, with that site as a council, we'd started talking to the proponents about them perhaps having the world's first carbon neutral motorsport park. And they were completely not interested. They couldn't see. They couldn't see the opportunity. We could see how it could be done, and um, you know they really they just they just had a very strong um, commercial kind of view. Um, that it juxtaposed with a with an experience we've just had in the council in approving um, or partially approving a, a big development up in Port Augusta for a big solar um, renewables uh, farm was that the proponents came to us and they said, we know that solar panels are bad for the environment, because they are, they're a bare earth proposition. You really just have to totally, you know, take it back to nothing. And they said, so they've been working with us for a fair bit of time um, in the design of this. And just by positioning their solar panels slightly off kilter, not square, we saved 600 hectares of vegetation. They then decided to build their solar farms half a metre, their solar, what do you call them, panels, half a metre higher, um, which meant that more sun could get into the vegetation and they didn't start from a, clear, a clearing. They didn't clear anything. They rolled over the veg that was there, which has an impact um, and has, you know, has some implications. But what, what's, what's already happening six months later is that vegetation is still intact. The habitat is still, you know, at least half there. And we're starting to see technology that they can do for no more, pro oh, you know, they might, it might have cost them a bit more to actually protect and restore and, you know, and sort of have development in, in a bit more of sync with, um, with the natural landscape. So, you know, there are, some, there are some, I think we need to raise the citizen's voice. Um, we need to deal with the power and influence of politics. We need to use our technological good to find new funky ways to do stuff. And um, yeah, I could go on and on, <laughs> but I'll stop. <laughs> Last example, they'll also find that they'll save money because they won't have to clean their solar panels. Out. Yeah, they don't. They don't have to clean them. So it's yep. become financially worthwhile as well. Yeah, for a room, it's about this size, um, one litre of water to clean the solar panels because there's no dust because the vegetation's still there. So you know, it's a win-win. It's a win-win-win-win on many scales, um, and you know, we just have to get really smart in terms of the policy frameworks, we've got the legislative frameworks to allow that innovation to happen. So, uh, Susan, back to you. This is the last question. So, we have just heard from the Penalty Council, so any environmental legislation in the United States at various circumstances. So, this maybe makes the last question something public. So, what do politicians look for in supporting and not supporting specific? Well, it, it, so politicians come with a set of knowledge and um, 
understanding and uh, and acquire more knowledge they also have their electorates telling us tell what what they they expect of us um so for environmental legislation the um whether you are a city-based MP or a country-based MP will affect your attitude. Uh, and that is largely partisan, but not entirely, of course. Uh, we have the Natural Resources Management Act. The NRM Act is going to be replaced by a landscape bill um, that's just been put into Parliament, which largely uh, removes mention of biodiversity, um, habitat restoration. Uh, it. Uh, says that the basic fundamentals of natural resources management are um, back to the water, soil and pest, plant and animal control, uh, rather than the idea of biodiversity being the basis of everything and then build from there. Um, so for uh, my side of politics, it's relatively easy for us to want to restore the environmental flavour to that legislation. It is more complex for parties that are dependent on communities saying, we don't like this NRM Act, we, you know, you've got to overturn it. So, so um, what we look for is something that we think is virtuous and good, uh, and something that we can still win elections with. And, you know, I don't, I, we can dress it up, but that's the truth. We are in, um, we ring, politics is about winning elections, but making them worth winning as well. Like most politicians go in because they want to make life better um, in the way that they understand it to be. Uh, so, legislation, uh, ideas for legislation that are relatively straightforward, that we can understand, that we can see how you do it and what the result will be, and that we can understand the um, electoral consequences of, that's, that's what we want to hear. And we've had incredible advice from the environment community over the decades. Uh, I was part of the Wilderness Society back when uh, the Wilderness Society was advocating for the uh, Wilderness Act, Wilderness Protection Act, and that was a fantastic piece of legislation that was supported by both sides of Parliament back in the 90s, uh, that finally meant that we could have areas that were truly, completely and utterly protected. There was a dedicated campaign from at least one, but uh, with an alliance of environmental organisations. The EPA um, Act, the Environment Protection Act, is a magnificent piece of legislation, no doubt needs updating, all of these do, but that was done because the people who understood the impact of the uh, of industrial activity on the environment were able to say how that should be managed in, in legislation and the public kind of went, yes, that makes sense, we don't want to have a dirty water and we, don't, and we want to have clean air. So um, there is a lot of hope for good legislation, particularly when you marry uh, people's general understanding that they'd like things to be better alongside um, a very active and well-informed environment community, which goes from academia through to uh, activists and through to young people. And I just want to say on the last thing, <laughs> uh, we're younger than I am. <laughs> um, if we lowered the voting age to 16, that would make a big difference to all of these issues. I'm a huge advocate for that. Absolutely change my world's calculation on what we need to do to win an election. Yeah. And it would all be progressive and environmental. Uh, so go advocate for that. Vol say voluntary voting 16 to 18, compulsory from 18, you'd get all the activist kids who understand that their future is at play here. That Old people like me, we're not going to be there when it all hits the wall, but they are. So um, that that's one big change that could happen in a different piece of legislation that would make a huge difference to all of these issues. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're open to questions. So this is the Yeah, thank you, Corey, for such an inspiring and uplifting presentation. Um, <clears throat> that was actually one of my most uplifting ones. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Which actually brings me to my question. There is this um, body of literature out there in psychology saying that you can't keep coming out with um, bad news because people turn off. And in my industry, the science communications industry, that's been taken as, well, let's not talk about how bad the environment is. And so that message isn't actually being presented. Most people in Australia do not know how bad things are. What do we do about that? I think the kids do. I think climate strike is a really good example. And Extinction Rebellion worldwide, people are starting to go, holy shit. It's, 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 I mean, sure, it's a small proportion, but people are actually taking to the streets now. 
And yes, they've done that since time immemorial, but in a f more fractured way. This is the first time we've seen global scale coordination of this. So I don't necessarily buy that. I see that obviously when I talked about you know the psychology of denial and defense, and that's a very real thing, there has to be some way forward. There has to be something one can do. You have to have a pathway that people, even if it's something simple like recycling, you know, it, it's not going to change the world, but at least it gives, and we were talking about just the, the whole panel is basically saying the same thing. As long as you've got some way to advance and do better, then I think we've got the, but at the same time, until you start saying, wow, this is really bad. And this is why I continue to come back to this because even I'm shocked and I should be unshockable by now. I'm like an ambo. I see death and destruction every day in an environmental sense. And, you know, many people who know me know that, you know, several years ago, I actually went into a clinical depression. It was mainly based on my job. Now, I got out of that thanks to good therapy and our wonderful healthcare system. <laughs> uh, but, homemade wine. And homemade wine. That, well, that's, you know, self-medication. That's not always the best thing. Uh, we do what we have to. Uh, but yet, even I am shocked. So I, I feel that it's my responsibility to, to, to not water it down. And yes, I have put more emphasis on the what we can do. I'm not a policymaker. I'm becoming more of one <laughs> as we go. And, 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 you know, I'm talking to politicians. I'm, I'm, I'm fronting up to parliamentary inquiries. I'm writing about it in popular press as well. And, you know, I'm just, there's small things that I can do, but I can't see myself water it down. So I, and, and I think the... Extinction Rebellion, we have representatives here today, the, the, the children rising up worldwide, even in places like Uganda, you know, it's just, that's marvelous. And I think that is starting to sink in, so. You might have seen Paul George Mombio's attack on David Attenborough, um, all now, what, a couple of, several months ago now, making a similar point that how can David Attenborough show the beauty, the stunning attraction, the, the the enormous um, wonder of nature when we should be doing it, uh, he should have been doing a Corey Bradshaw presentation. <laughs> and I, I think George Monbiot got it wrong because you can only love what you know. And David Attenborough introduces all of the, particularly younger generation, but all of us, to that wonder of nature. So we go, wow. Then you need George Monbiot or you need Corey or you need all of us really to come in and go, but there's a real problem with this. So you actually need more David Attenboroughs to be the leaders of this is what you're losing and this is what is so wonderful about planet Earth and this galaxy. Then you need your, your Corys and your Jordan Monbiot. It's not one or the other. Mm. Both are absolutely vital to get the message across. I've got a quick little thing quick. that um, I, just on that that I saw happen yesterday was the ice coffee shortage, yes. um, which is a disaster apparently because um, we can't, ha we don't have enough milk for iced coffee, for two litre iced coffees, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And it's because of drought. Well, someone needs to do something about that, was what I saw in the advertiser. And my thought was, really? Are we that disconnected that we go, oh yeah, drought, 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 but we'll still get our iced coffee. You know, this is the moment, I reckon, that is the moment where we need to step in and go, yeah. So this is, you're feeling it, because it's your thing that you love. Um, but there's a bigger message there. So it's kind of looking for those little windows. And did you and appreciate the irony that in the same week that we had the iced coffee drought in South Australia, Sweden declared that coffee was not an essential yes, commodity? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, we just, and we just have water allocations. Open I have greater beef with them. <laughs> yeah, so we've had opening allocations, and, you know, I, I do a lot of work in water, a lot of volunteering work in water policy stuff, and it's kind of like seven years of drought in Queensland, and there's outrage that we're opening at 14%. Really? Where's it coming? Where do they expect it's coming from? Like, we're really disconnected, and we've got to find ways to just reconnect. It's inevitable. If there's a drought in Queensland, it's going to affect us. So it's going to reconnect us. I think the other thing to do is to incorporate the facts into general conversation, general media. So The Guardian doing that with the carbon emissions, there's a woman um, 
presenter who, I can't think of what channel, but it's a weather channel where she just goes, okay, so this is the temperature this week. It's this much percent higher than it has been at, on average. Like she just chucks it in there, little little comment. And that's enough to start people thinking. You don't have to say, oh, it's really bad and the world's going to end. But telly. you can go, hey, this is a thing. Just think about it. <coughs> <coughs> Hi, Corey and the panel. My name's Rob Fowler. I've been a professor at UniSA at Uni in the environmental law field for 40 years and I share many of your your concerns and pessimisms and just managed to avoid the nervous collapse as well. Um, there's been some recent studies out of in, in the last 10 or 20 years out of Melbourne University showing that the predictions of the Club of Rome, um, which were just basic computer models, were, were still being shown to be relatively accurate and, and that... that brings me to the point about urgency, that the fact is that many of these trends, I think, not only are not well recognised within our communities around the world, but the, the urgency of them is also not recognised. And one of the things I wasn't clear about from what you were saying about population growth seemed to me to be that you were suggesting that no matter what we did around consumption and economic growth and all the drivers behind climate change and biodiversity, resource extraction, for example, would be an aspect of that. Uh, the UN's just reported that I think 65% of climate change and 80% of biodiversity loss is attributable directly to resource extraction at a global level. It's a fascinating figure just in March this year. But with all those things happening and, and the sense of urgency, my, my sense is you're suggesting that population growth is sort of going to still overwhelm everything and, and that therefore many other measures are not likely. They're going to be counterbalanced by this continued um, rate of population growth, which we really can't do much about. Did I misunderstand what you were trying to say there, or is, is that part of the part of the the, the, the wicked problem that we face? I, I suppose it's a little bit. Um, I, I describe it like this: if if you look at pulling small levers, and, and really that's, those are only options. The only lever we can pull uh, in a, in a, from, from a human population perspective that has any sort of ethical foundation is, of course, dealing with fertility. Yeah, you know, there's not. We can't go out and start wars and, and, you know, we don't want to do anything like that. But we do have very uh, useful and, and um, effective policies. And interestingly enough, up until about the, uh, the late 80s, uh, family planning programs being rolled out by the UN and the WHO all over the world, um, and which had huge uh, effects on, on reducing fertility and improving livelihoods and, and uh, giving, giving more rights to women and... Um, they, they kind of lost favor as soon as the HIV AIDS epidemic really got into full swing because that became a much more popular, <laughs> not really probably the best choice of word, source of or, or target for overseas um, aid. And it's still in a lot of ways that system and we, we have lost that ability. Now certain countries have done it on their own right and they've reaped the benefits. Um, Bangladesh and Thailand are really good examples. Now, there are no pinnacles of the kind of societies the world probably should aspire to be, but they're a lot better than they used to be. And whereas you've got counter uh, counterfactuals like the Philippines, which has had no population policy whatsoever, and it's a basket case. Uh, so the, the fact that we've got the dem demonstration that it can work and it can improve lives, and the fact that, yes, we should have started 50 years ago after the war and really thinking about population clearly, but every con contribution that we make now is going to make future generations' lives better. So there's no, it's just like climate change. There's no magic threshold where it's 1.5 or 2 degrees. It's a sliding scale, right? There's, we don't have 12 years to act. We should act now. We, we, it's not about there's, a, there's some threshold that we cross and it all turns to tears. Every bit of incremental improvement on any scale human population, climate, biodiversity, restoration is a good thing. And so I think part of the conversation is that we've talked about so-called thresholds and arbitrary lines in the sand, if you will, and we, we hold fast to those because people think that that's what other people will digest. No, no, no. Every single contribution we make that's positive is a good thing. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't restrict us from acting. And um, Corey, correct me if I go astray. So there's a there's a bit of a conundrum in there because, uh, in general, and a, and a highly Catholic population like the Philippines is a little bit counter. But in general, development leads to a lower 
rate of popular of birth, a lower birth rate. So educating Except women. Except in Africa. Uh, <laughs> and as you said, Africa is a bit. Although I think some of the nations in Africa have followed that. So, uh, but but the challenge is that if as you become more developed and you have a more sophisticated education system, so women get an education and women have aspirations, and so they don't find themselves having so many children or wanting so many children, um, you are causing an ecological toll per capita. In the, consumption uh, in the consumption rate. So somehow what we need to do is not only drop the birth rate, but also detach development from ecological impact. And while we see so many trends going in the right direction, um, you know, in terms of death in violence and infant mortality and so on, we see every ecological trend going the wrong way. So although we're we understand that we need to decarbonise our economy and our society. We also need to de-slaughter of wildlife uh, <laughs> our economy and our society. And I think that's the harder one for us to understand. Yeah. We can sort of grasp that we need to put, even though we're not doing it sufficiently, but we can grasp what the climate change t challenge is. I don't think we quite grasp what we need to do differently so that we're not destroying insect life. It feels a bit remote and our capacity to have an effect on that feels a bit remote and that's where I, I would like to better understand not only how I could live my own life but what kind of legislation would help put us on that trend and what kind of conversation so that when I'm at the shopping centre or at the doors in Port Adelaide I can be saying look you know there's this problem but this is one way that we can tackle it so that would be very helpful. So is, is that really then about the education and empowerment of women? Maybe it's time South Australia had a female feminine. I think that was directed at you. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that, that didn't go the way <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on that population point. Does that then bring us to reconsidering euthanasia and sterilisation? Because I don't know what's been done about that. I've been asking to be sterilised since I was 18 and no one will touch me and they're like, oh, you might change your mind. It's a good thing to have children. How do you change that if developed countries are saying, you know, it's okay if you're an unhealthy woman who has no concept of the future and is doing things to your body that's not good, but you can still go and get IVF. We'll help you have children. But if you're a healthy young female that says, I don't want children, you can't get help to not have children. And then we keep everyone alive using resources for, for beyond when they want to be around. How do we address that if we're looking at the population problem? Well, I'm probably in the, the worst demographic to answer that question. Uh, but I will, uh, Paul Willis, who's over here, used to be the director of the Royal Institution of Australia. Um, we had, you remember the, um, the vasectomy clinic we had at the, so we had um, a vasectomy surgeon on stage doing live vasectomies from people in the audience who just put their hand up. And he did it right there in five minutes while Paul Ehrlich and I talked about population issues. So he was actively sterilizing people. Why were we talking? I could smell the smoke from the cauterization as I was talking. And we were broadcasting, and we were broadcasting live. Yes. Uh, and um, it, it, it did really burst the stigma bubble of that, I think, a lot for a lot of people, because they went, oh, no big deal. Um, now, I think the other thing to remember from the little bit I, I understand about family planning policies is that you can have essentially the same demographic effect as long, if you have a good family planning uh, policy in place and you have the resources in place. The, the question about choosing self-sterilization notwithstanding, if access to contraception, if promotion of false, the benefits of small families, if promotion of equality between the sexes is part of that process, and this is way out of my field, you get the same demographic effect and the same benefits back to the families. So do I think that that could be added? Yes, but I think we also could achieve just as much, if not more, by doing what we've already done really well in the past. So, yeah. <laughs> I probably don't want to go too much farther down that line. Thank you very much.